Good morning. One of the benefits of sitting in the front row is I get to hear all of you sing, and you guys were ramping it up today. I absolutely loved hearing your voices. And by the way, if you really enjoy those kinds of worship moments, this coming Tuesday we have Currents, and uh, you're welcome to join us for a really powerful time of worship, uh, a little bit more extended than what we had here this morning. Uh, one other thing before I launch into the message, and that is... Uh, uh, when you've been in ministry as long as I have, you see uh, the development and establishing of relationships. And, and in those early days when people are uncertain uh, uh, about how much uh, distance this relationship has in terms of its potential, they might be a little reluctant to make other people aware of it. And back in the day, you just had to tell your friends and they told their friends and so on. But now we have social media. And so you can go on and, and post what your relationship is on social media. And, and what, are, what are they doing? Well, uh, some people think they're bragging, maybe. Uh, some people think that they're actually declaring. It's, it's, it's a, a part of the step. It's, it's upping the ante a little bit. And when you think about it, one of the things they're doing is they're calling everyone who knows them to help hold them accountable to the relationship they're in. If you see me acting a little bit out of bounds, like if you see me with another person, that's not how it's supposed to be. And so you're asking other people to weigh in. Water baptism is like that. For a lot of us in our faith, there's a very private and personal aspect of our relationship with God. But there's also a moment when we can go public with our faith and take something that's been intensely private and move it into the public realm and not just as a declaration, but also as a, a request to those who know and love us to help hold us accountable to the relationship with our Heavenly Father that we have. And so if you are interested in water baptism, uh, you can see someone at the Welcome Center on the way out, or you can find an opportunity to sign up on our uh, website for baptism, which will be taking place next month. We're continuing on in our series in Matthew, and uh, uh, a lot of times we'll struggle with... Uh, not being able to do something or fear like if we try, we might fail at it. And, and that, that tension can actually impact the choices that we make and the options we exercise. And so uh, there's this really interesting story end of chapter 17 that I'd like us to take a few minutes and look at today. And so we'll start in verse 14, Matthew 17. Verse 14, it says, when they came to the crowd, so Jesus has just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. We talked about that last Sunday. Now they've come down the mountain. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. This is Jesus' response. You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? How many, if I started the message this morning, how long shall I stay with you? You would think he's had a bad week. Like, <laughs> Jesus rebuked, or this is what he says, bring the boy here to me. And then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. And then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. It's very easy to focus on this story in terms of the healing of the boy, but there's a lot more going on, and it's not the central point of the story. The story is less about the healing of the boy and more about helping the disciples' inability. There was something that they, was, they were unable to do, and Jesus wanted to address that. Now, it's really interesting to me that with Matthew, he almost always equates exorcisms to healings. A lot of times we see it as, as kind of um, a divine way to purge out something that is tainted with uh, corrupt and dark spiritual influences. And for Matthew, what he sees is that there's probably a kind of brokenness and a woundedness that has facilitated what has become entrenched deeply in their life. And when that is healed, freedom is the next step that, that comes. It's just a really 
really interesting way to think about that. And so uh, this is one of those uh, passages also that is about a third party healing. Lots of the stories in the Gospels of people are of people who come to Jesus and they ask for healing for themselves. But there's also many stories in Matthew's Gospel about people coming for someone else. How many are glad that when you, when you help bring people to Jesus, that's when problems start being solved? Isn't that good news? It's really good news. So we've seen Jesus' power over the demonic. In fact, we've seen it in chapters 4, 8, 9, 12, and 15. So this is not a new concept. And once again, we see that happen here. And I'm, I'm very aware that there are people who they're frustrated by this story and the idea that there's anything uh, of a spiritual nature going on. Because the modern mind would just say, the boy has epilepsy. And, and this is what religion does. Things they don't understand, they, they equate with some kind of superstitious purpose. And, and now that we have more scientific information, we can just assume that that is a, a medical issue or an emotional issue and there are appropriate actions to take. And uh, it would miss something that's very important, and that is that these were not just random events that occurred in this child's life, but specifically when he was near fire or he was near water. He would have these seizures and fall into the fire and fall into the water, and it was intended by a dark force to take this child's life. And so, we in the modern world do know epilepsy is a real thing. There's lots of disease states and many options to take, but that doesn't mean that there are not still some things that medical options alone can, can uh, take care of or can heal or can resolve. And so here we see Jesus and he recognizes this is not just a physical thing, which he could heal, but there's something else going on here. It's not just a random event. And in another gospel, it talks about with humans, this is impossible or unable, but with God, all things are possible or with God, all things are ables. They're all possible. So why is Jesus frustrated? And uh, I think there's some help in understanding that because he actually cares for those who are suffering. It's in his hands that problems begin to be solved. And he identifies the generation as unbelieving and perverse. And that language is intentional. He's not just having a rough day. He's not just frustrated in the moment, but it's intentional. It takes us all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, where that exact phrase is used. He connects us to a point in history so that we can understand what's actually happening in the dynamic of that situation. And so he uses the same language as, as Deuteronomy 32 to describe a generation of Israelites who did not have faith in God in their process of wandering through the wilderness. He had brought them out of the land of slavery. They were slaves in Egypt, and he brought them out miraculously into uh, our, his plan to lead them to the promised land, but they had to go through this wilderness experience first. And they don't have faith faith. And before we're too hard on them, you say, it'd be so easy to look at them and say, yeah, those ah, just drives me nuts. You know, why, why do people do that? Look at all God did for them. And now they don't have faith. Hold on. Just look. God did do a lot and he got them out of slavery, but where are they now? They're in the wilderness. Have you ever heard of the expression out of the frying pan and into the fire? The wilderness is not a fun place. I mean, I know there's some YouTube channels where people just go out into the wilderness and prove they can survive for like 48 hours by bringing everything in their house on their back <laughs> and a drone to prove it to everybody else. I just love watching those things. Uh, the challenge for the Israelites is that when they were facing very hot days and either unbearably hot nights or unbearably cold nights, and when they only had one source of food and when they weren't sure about water and, and, and when it seems like they were making no progress, they began to wonder. They began to doubt. And, and they began to worry. In fact, they actually said things like this. It probably would have been better for us to stay where we were. 
And that happens with people now. They'll start looking to God to help and then it feels like things are getting a little bit worse. And, and then they'll think, maybe, maybe this faith option is not the best option for me. All it does is create some unrealistic expectations. Like the, nothing's really going to change and they fear being disappointed and they fear that their faith is too fragile and they fear that they're going to fail. And so they allow those fears to drive their decisions. And they train themselves to expect nothing at all in life. Some of us in this room already have a graduate degree in that. And this approach keeps us from trying. It keeps us from daring. It keeps us from stretching. It keeps us from growing. We, we don't make any progress. And, and what we think we've done is we've, at least we're on solid ground. But when you live like that, you're not just on solid ground. You're digging a hole that has no end. You can dig that hole for the rest of your life. You're never going to hit anything that will be solid. I think there's a message for the church in that, that a church that does not believe that God can actually help make things better in our lives and in our world winds up receiving some very strong language from Jesus. I don't think it's helpful for us to run around and talk about how bad things are and everything's going to get worse. I think it's really helpful to tell people that in the midst of all the challenges and the pain and the brokenness and the darkness of our world, if you will bring God into your life, he will help you start getting out of the hole you've dug for yourself and there actually is something better in the future than what we've experienced in our past. Amen? Amen. So question. Just think about it, ponder it. Maybe think about it after you get home today. Do you try to protect yourself from hoping Jesus can help you? Do you try to protect yourself from hoping that Jesus can help you? Now there's another part of this that I want to go into and that is that I think it's unwise to equate confidence in ourselves with confidence in Christ. We know from previous verses in Matthew that Jesus had authorized and granted authority to the disciples to go out and to bring healing to people and, and to set people free from demonic influence. And this is something that they had succeeded in. So they had done things like this. This wasn't like their first time and they tried and they failed. This situation was they tried and they couldn't understand why they were unable to make it work. And it could be, I don't know for sure, but it could be that their confidence is in how they've been able to do it before. And this is one of the great challenges in religion is that, that we often come to the place where we believe when you do it this way, that's how it works. So you just have to, you have to stand like this. Get your posture in there. All right. I feel like I'm, I'm about to hit a golf ball. I don't know. And then... And you have to put your hand out like that. It helps to lower your voice. Demons are very afraid of low voices. You know, just come out. And, 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 then the, and then the demon goes, oh, oh that's, that's, that's scary. And, and no doubt, like stuff like that, it worked for them. But they're in a situation now that is very different from any situation that they had faced before. And what they had done before was not working for them. So the question is, was their confidence really in the authority that God had given them or was their confidence in their ability to handle that situation because they had done it before? I think there's a lot of, of uh, crossover realities for us. And the thing about when you have confidence in yourself, and I'm not anti-confidence. God bless you if you've got confidence in something. How many are glad that our worship team has confidence that they can play the right notes at the right time and sing the right words at the right Aren't you glad? Yeah. And so, but here's the thing. Confidence is great until something goes wrong. And, and then everything falls apart. And what Jesus wants his disciples to know is that his authority is not activated by our confidence in ourselves. His authority is activated by our trust in him. Two very different things. Confidence is not a synonym for faith. Trust is. Well, I can tell they have a lot of faith. Really? Yeah, they're so confident. Hmm. So Jesus rebukes the demonic spirit and the boy is healed in that moment, which is really interesting. And then freedom and health are restored to the boy. And if you're the parent of that child, I can't imagine what kind of toll this has taken on their lives. You can't let this get out of their sight because if there's any danger at all, he falls into it. 
And I can't imagine how much relief there was when they saw their child completely whole and healed. It had to be a really remarkable moment. And then it tells us that, that the disciples take Jesus aside and there's a private conversation. And, and Jesus does this throughout the Gospels. It, it, it's really a, a, an interesting thing. And I, I think it's something worth thinking about. So he, he, he says things publicly and then he debriefs privately. He, he works healings and, and actions given to him by God in public. And, and then he, he does a debriefing moment in, in private. And, and in fact, uh, I, I did a little uh, research on this. And, and in chapter 16, he actually has, he, he talks about discipleship, but then when he, he has his disciples in a debriefing moment, he talks about denying yourself and taking up your cross. And he's telling them that he's headed to a cross. And in chapter 17, there's, there's like three of these. He, he, he debriefs them on, on why people tend to fail to recognize who God is using in circumstances. Because people didn't recognize John the Baptist and they didn't recognize him. And he said, this is why people tend to miss what God is doing in our world and who God is, is using. And then he also, the, the thing we're on right now is a, is a debrief on faith. And, and we're going to get through this today. And, and then he does a debrief on freedom and stumbling. It's a phenomenal lesson. And, and then in chapter 18, he does a debriefing on restoration, what it is to, to have a, an individual restored or a relationship restored. And, and he also does a debriefing on forgiveness. And, he, and in chapter 19, he has a debriefing on divorce and what goes on with people who have to endure this incredibly difficult thing and, and why people are so injured by it. And by the way, he also does a debriefing on celibacy because Christianity was really the only religion in the world that, that gave any credibility or status to a person who was living a single lifestyle. And, and Jesus does a debriefing on that. And then the, in, in, he also does a debriefing on children, how we should view children, which is very different from the rest of the world, and how we should interact with children, and how we should think about that in terms of our status. And then he does a debriefing on wealth, and how that in, in influences how we think about things and ourselves in life, and about salvation. And then in, also in 19, he debriefs on reward. What is reward, and what do we seek, and why do we want it? And, and how does that affect our status? And then in chapter 20, he does a debriefing on leadership. Like, how do we think about leadership when you're asked to be responsible for some project or a group of people? And how does that affect your status? This is the thing about discipleship. It is so easy, especially in our Western culture, to look at discipleship as though it is just something that if you can just remember and recall the important doctrinal statements and repeat them at the right time, the world will be saved. And that's actually not how Jesus teaches discipleship. You could actually take those debriefing moments and develop an entire discipleship uh, process around it. Because for Jesus, he's, he doesn't assume, if you just go tell somebody, by the way, you're not perfect, uh, good news for you, God has done something about that, Jesus died for your sins, he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, you're welcome. <laughs> and it's not how he thinks about discipleship. They hear things and they see things and then he pulls them aside and this is what discipleship is to Jesus. I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to understand how this actually works. I want you to understand what this actually means. It's a very, very different thing. So they said, why were we unable to help this boy? A lack of faith frustrates Jesus because it leaves us and others in situations God wants to help in. That's why it frustrates Jesus. So why were we unable? That's the question they ask. And Jesus' response is, little faith. Little faith. It's interesting to me that when it comes to our inabilities in life, we're far more likely to blame other and shallower reasons for why we were unable. Uh, well, I, you know, sometimes my temper flares up. Some, I just have a weakness or inability in that area. I have certain habits I don't seem to be able to break. I have certain desires that seem to exercise more control over me than I wish they would. I have certain addictions that kind of control aspects of my life. I have certain moods. I mean, you know, you you know, you know me and my moods, and I have certain ambitions. And, and Jesus reminds us, back to the very first humans, that at the root of every other sin and inability is our life is an unwillingness to trust God. 
because Adam and Eve thought either God was trying to hold something from them or that they were somehow unworthy to get something or that he would give it to them. And so when you think that God is not willing and you think that you're not worthy, the only option left is either to take something that doesn't belong to you or to sit far enough back that nobody notices you. And this is the challenge. So what's the solution for little faith? And you're not going to believe it. When I say it, you're going you're gonna to say, that's crazy, right? Here's the solution for little faith. Little faith. It sounds like a paradox, right? But isn't that what Jesus says? They, they said, why could we not cast this thing out? And, and he says, little faith. What's the solution? If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, and he just came down from one, move and, and it will move. Now, that's confusing. The good news for us is when we, when we feel like we're missing a piece of information, a lot of these stories are contained in other Gospels. And so when we go to Mark's Gospel, you can find it in chapter 9. What we discovered there is Jesus also added one more thing. This kind does not come out except by prayer. What, what is he saying? Use little faith as a reason to pray rather than as a reason to give up. Use little faith as a reason to pray rather than as a reason to give up. We learned last week that the source of our authority is to listen to him. That's what God says from heaven, right? In an audible voice. This is my son whom I love and him I will please. Listen to him. The source of our helping ability is to talk to him. Listen to him. Authority. Talk to him, ability. Jesus did not say, if you have faith the size of a mountain, you can move a mountain. He did not say, if you believe much, you can accomplish much. That is being confident in ourselves. Just a little faith, a little faith, like the grain of a seed, a mustard seed. And I have to tell you, prayer is one of the hard things. Like, oh, here, if, I, if I said we were having a concert, Lots of people would come. If I said we were having a conference, lots of people would come. If I said we're having a prayer gathering, I wish I could, Pastor, I do. It's, why, why is it not so popular? And, and there's reasons behind that. In Acts chapter 6, the church was growing logarithmically and, and, and the leadership was overstretched and they were having a challenge that uh, regarding some uh, uh, distributing uh, some of the social uh, needs uh, addressing some of the social needs. And so the leadership of the church made a decision. You can find this in Acts chapter 6. This is what they said. They said, uh, we are going to appoint this group of seven to take care of that social program. And the leadership is going to devote itself to preaching of the word and prayer. Doesn't that sound interesting? Preaching of the word, listen to him. Prayer, talk to him. This is like a breathing exercise in the church. This is how faith breathes. Listen to him. Talk to him. Listen to him. Talk to him. Prayer is talking to him. And this is where the third time the word unable is used. Your disciples were unable the disciples came to him and they said, why were we unable to cast this out? And Jesus says this, nothing will be impossible. In the original Greek, it's connected to the word unable. This is how you could say it. Nothing will be unable for you. <laughs> Isn't that great? Jesus wants to inspire enough faith to pray expecting miracles. We don't have to feel adequate or ashamed because our faith is weak. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. Even little faith prayers throb with God's power. Just a little faith. Don't equate faith with self-confidence. That's going to fluctuate based on your circumstances. This is why when we gather, like right now, what are we doing? We're looking into God's word and we're listening to what it has to say. Listen to him. Will you breathe out? 
Or will you just hold your breath? Let your faith breathe. Let your faith breathe. So we're going to try an experiment this morning. I know this always makes people anxious. And, and you might say, Pastor, I don't have any faith at all. Maybe you do and you don't know it. I'd like you all to stand. And uh, right now what I'd like you to do is to think of someone in your life, someone in your life, who they're ill or they have a sickness, maybe some incapacitating physical limitation. Just bring them to your mind and identify them by name. Okay? Now I want you to think of one sentence, one sentence, that will talk to God about that. So you, you might say something like this. My friend James is struggling with and I'm asking you to bring healing. You don't have to use those exact words. Any sentence will do. So just call to your mind someone who is not well, and you are going to talk to God for them. All right? When I count three, we're all going to say this out loud, and here's, here's what I want. I, you don't need to shout this. But don't just think a thought. There's a difference between little faith that thinks it can't do anything and little faith that's willing to pray. And this is all prayer is. It's not loud voices. It's, it's, it's not postures or positions. It's just talking to God, little faith. So I'm gonna to count to three and whatever your sentence is, I'm gonna ask you to say that out loud to the one who hears every one of our expressions today. All right, one, two, three. All right. Now I want you to think about someone who's struggling with provision. I've got two friends. Uh, one is losing their job and the other doesn't have a job. And so I'm going to double up on this one. But someone who's struggling financially, maybe they need an opportunity for a job. Maybe there's, they don't have enough money to get out of the month. Whatever it is, you know someone who's, who's in a situation like that. And think of one sentence to ask God for help. And when I count three, we're going to ask God for help for them. Ready? One, two, three. I want you to think of someone who's going through relational challenges. Maybe they're in discontent or in contention with somebody else, or maybe there's just no relationship. They're isolated, they're alone. And by the way, in any of these, and it's you, you're allowed to talk to God about yourself. How many are glad about that? Yeah. And, uh, and so on the count of three, one sentence prayer, and let's ask God to begin to help them in that relational situation. situation. Ready? One, two, three. And it's as simple as that. You probably didn't feel anything special. And you probably didn't feel particularly powerful. And you might have even spoke softer than you ordinarily speak because you were concerned someone next to you might hear, but you did something. You listened to him and now you talked to him. And what you did is you just unleashed the incredible power of God's spirit to make a difference in other people's lives. Can we give him thanks for that this morning?